Perhaps you could open your Bible with me this morning at the chapter that we read together, John's Gospel, chapter 21. And I suppose the verse, if you want one to look to as the basis of the message this morning, is found in verse 12. And it says simply this, Jesus said to them, Come on at breakfast, or if you're using the King James Bible, it's come and dine. We just will join with me now in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we come again to you and pray that you will meet our need. We pray that whatever we lack, that you will grant unto us in your grace, whatever we don't know, that you will teach us. We pray that you will grant unto us power and grace as we either speak or listen to your word. And we pray that your name will be glorified amongst us. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, if you were with us last Lord's Day, you will recall that we commenced a short series uh, on three gracious invitations that the Lord Jesus extends to his people. The first we looked at last Sunday in John's Gospel, chapter 1 and verse 39, which was an invitation to follow him when he said to the two disciples of John, who had heard the word of their master, Behold the Lamb of God, and began to follow Jesus. And Jesus, turning to them, saw them following, and said, Come and see. So it was an invitation to follow. And then there was, and is, an invitation to a feast. That's what we're going to be looking at this morning. But Jesus said, Come and dine. And then finally, We'll be looking next week, if the Lord spares us, at Mark 6 and verse 31, where Jesus said to his disciples, Come aside and rest a while. An invitation to follow, an invitation to a feast, and an invitation to find, to find rest in himself. And we suggested to you on that occasion that basically these three things summarize our entire Christian experience. We follow the Lord, we feast with and indeed upon the Lord, and we find our rest in the Lord. Now each of these in itself is evidence of Christ's the continuing devotion to his people. It is evidence again of his continual desire for the well-being of all of those whom he loves and has bought by his precious blood. And as I said last week, our thoughts were focused upon this whole thought and teaching in Scripture of following Christ. And we ask ourselves the question, what is involved, or indeed, what does it mean to follow Jesus? Because it's a, an expression, just like many expressions that we use in Christianity, which is upon our lips many times, but we don't really grasp the full import of what is being taught to us. We put it to you last week that following the Lord Jesus Christ involves, at the very least, first of all, seeing him as our example. The word that Paul uses in Ephesians chapter 5, when he says to the believers there, be followers of God as dear children, is a Greek word from which we get the word imitators. Be imitators of God. As I say, that must suggest that Christ is our pattern, Christ is our example. And the Apostle Peter reminded us of this when he said in his first letter to the believers, he said that Christ has left us an example that we should follow in his steps. You will remember, of course, that this is the great will of God for all of us in our salvation to, to make us more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ and eventually to make us perfectly like the Lord Jesus Christ because when he shall appear, John tells us that we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. And therefore it is imperative for us to keep our focus upon Jesus Christ as our example. It is as we see him revealed to us in the gospel, in the preaching of the word of God that we are being conformed to his image. Because, as Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 3.18, it is by beholding him that we become conformed to his image. So if the following him involves seeing him as our example, following him involves surrendering to him as our Lord. 
We recognize his authority. We talked a little about that last week. We recognize that the authority of the Lord is not one of, uh, of a tyrant. It's not one of a cruel taskmaster. It is the authority of a Father who loves us with an eternal, unmeasurable, and unchangeable love. And gladly, therefore, we bow our knee, and as the hymn writer says, we crown him Lord of all, and we follow after. It means also not only seeing him as our guide and surrendering to him as our Lord, but it means, or seeing him as our Lord, it means submitting to him as our guide. We are wandering, we are walking through a wilderness in this world. John Bunyan began in his great work, The Pilgrim's Progress, with those very words, as I walk through the wilderness of this world. We need a guide. We need one who will lead us in the right way. We may not who will direct us in the right path. And therefore, to follow him, we recognize him as our shepherd, and we as his flock. He tells us in John chapter 10, the words of Jesus himself, that when he puts forth his own sheep, they go, he goes before them and he leads them out. And so what is ours? It is ours to follow. It is ours to focus upon him and to walk in his steps. And we know that as we thought about all of this, that the Lord Jesus perceives our following. His eye is, is ever upon us. At one level, that's a sobering thought. But at another level, it is an extremely comforting thought. Because he knows exactly where we're at, as they say. He knows when we stumble, when we fall, when we wander. And as he keeps his eye upon us, he does so not with a, an eye to raising his rod to beat us, but a, with an eye to extending his hand to help us. And so he perceives us and he takes pleasure in our following after him. We need to remember, brethren and sisters, that the way in which the Lord leads us is described for us in the 23rd Psalm. We're told that he leads us in the paths of righteousness. And wherever the Lord leads us and however the Lord directs us, he doesn't simply do so because he can. It is not a mere exercise of naked power. Well, he it certainly does, as our sovereign have that power, but he leads us because he has our best interest at heart. And he leads us in a way that is good for us. You remember how the Lord told Israel that the law that he gave even at Sinai, that was for the people's good. And how we chafe against this at times, not recognizing that the way of the Lord is right. The way of the Lord is good. Or in the words of Proverbs 3, 17 and 18, when it speaks of wisdom, it says that all her ways are pleasantness and all her paths are peace. As for God, the psalmist said, his way is perfect. And what a blessing and privilege it is then with eyes upon our dear shepherd to follow in the way that he leads us and he guides us. Come and see is the word to his followers. Today we want to consider this second gracious invitation. And if the first was an invitation to follow, the second is an invitation to a feast. As I've said in the words of the translation, the King James Bible, in John 21 and 12, the words are three, simply come and dine. But the Greek word that is here translated by the King James translators as dying is a word which very literally means break fast. And so the Lord is in fact inviting us to come and breakfast with him, and to come and sup with him, to use the words of Revelation 3 and verse 20. Now in the context of this particular verse, we understand from what the verse 14 tells us that this was the, four, the third time that Jesus was revealed to his disciples after he was risen from the dead. It was a manifestation of Christ himself to his own. And brethren and sisters, there is a lesson there to be learned. Is there a need for us today? Is there a need for us every day? There is a need for us certainly to see the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And as we are gathered here this morning, is it not for that very purpose that we might see him? That he might manifest himself to us, to our souls, again through the word? I trust that we've already seen him manifested to us in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. And now in the preaching of the word, we, we, we long, we yearn, we pray in the words of the Greeks who came to Philip and said, Sir, we would see Jesus. We yearn that today that he might manifest himself through his word to our souls. And this was one such manifestation to the disciples collectively. There were other manifestations that he made to individuals, to Mary at the tomb, for example, to the two on the road to a mess. But this was the third time when an assembled group of disciples had this glorious privilege of seeing the risen Lord. The first one was on Resurrection Sunday. The second one was the following Sunday. And this event taking place sometime after that. And so we want to consider this manifestation of Christ to his disciples under three headings. First of all, we'll consider the people to whom this was made. Secondly, we will have a look at the particulars of this particular manifestation, or the specifics that are laid out for us here in the Word of God. And thirdly, we will consider the purpose of it. The people, the particulars, and the purpose. Who were these people? Well, obviously, they were disciples of the Lord. We're actually given the, the number of them. There's seven of them here. But what can we say about them? What can we say about them in terms of where they were at? I mean, spiritually speaking. I don't mean geographically or physically speaking. Where were they at, spiritually speaking, on this occasion? How do we describe these men on this occasion? I don't want to be overly harsh but I think the word failure is the one that comes to mind you say well why, why do you say that well remember remember what happened in Gethsemane just a few days earlier the Lord Jesus Christ had been arrested he was to be put on trial for his life and we are told that the disciples all forsook him and fled these were the men who were now here in the boat on Galilee fishing on this night to whom the Lord manifested himself. They were men who had failed the Lord. They were men who had deserted the Lord. We can go even further and say that one of these men, in particular Simon Peter, and there's an emphasis made uh, later on in verses 15 and following on the Lord's dealings with Peter. But Simon Peter, you know, not only deserted the Lord in Gethsemane, Peter denied the Lord in Pilate's judgment hall. These men, therefore, have failed the Lord. I think that that is just a, a simple statement of fact. They had deserted him. Peter had denied him. These men had fallen spiritually. They had fallen badly. They had fallen publicly before the enemies of the Savior, and they had fallen in spite of the fact that they had been previously warned by the Lord that this exactly was what was going to happen. You remember how Peter so vehemently protested his loyalty to Christ. Though all should deny you, Lord, yet will not I. And whatever you might think of Peter and think of his behavior and words on that occasion, he wasn't being insincere. He really believed that. He really believed that his love for Christ was of such a degree and his loyalty to Christ was, was of such an extent that though everybody else might forsake and deny the Lord, it wasn't possible for him to do this. You're reminded, are we not, of the words of Paul on another occasion when he said, let him that thinketh he stands take heed lest he fall. <clears throat> Peter fell into a sin of which he never thought he was capable. Ponder that thought for a moment. Ponder the fact that this man was an apostle. He was one of the inner circle. Peter, James and John were taken by the Lord Jesus to places where, where the other disciples weren't. They were taken to the Mount of Transfiguration. They were taken with him into the room where Jairus' daughter lay dead and witnessed the resurrection. They were taken a little further by him in the Garden of Gethsemane. 
These were the men who were close to the Lord, who loved the Lord, who were loyal to the Lord. And were not these men the, 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 the people who you thought would be the least likely to fall into the sin of desertion? Was Peter not, in our estimation, the least likely individual to fall into the sin of denying the Lord? Brothers and sisters, there's a very sobering lesson there for us this morning. That we are perfectly capable of committing sins of which we never thought we were capable. Now that's scary. Robert Murray McShane, the young pastor of St. Peter's Church, Church of Scotland, a day in Scotland in the 1800s, a young man who saw revival in this congregation before the Lord took him home at the young age of 29. Murray McShane said that he learned that the seed of every known sin was in his heart. If you think, if I think this morning, that there's some sin of which I am incapable, I am very, very icy ground indeed. Sometimes we express our shock and amazement when someone who previously noted for holiness and even usefulness in the service of the Lord falls into perhaps a very grave and heinous sin. And sometimes, you know, when that happens, we join the, the chorus of the ungodly world in pointing the finger and condemning and condemning. We need to pull ourselves up short and put the brakes on and recognize that we are too are very capable of exactly the same thing. And we need to take to heart the words spoken by an old English reformer in the days of England's Reformation. And prior to the Reformation, he lived in a house that was close to Tyburn, which is where the criminals were hanged. And he would see them being taken from the prison uh, past his home on the cart to the place of execution and he was known to have said there but for God's grace go I. I've asked you before and again I challenge not only you but my own heart with this do you and I really believe that statement? When we see a believer falling when we see an eminent child of God falling, falling grievously perhaps falling into a sin that is even noted before an ungodly world, falling into a sin perhaps that they have preached against. Do we not ask ourselves the question, is it true that there but for God's grace go I? I said to you before, if we believe that, it should make us tremble. If we should believe that, it should make us humble. And if we believe that, it should make us gentle to the fallen. Think of these men who had walked with the Lord for three years. They had not deserted him during the days of his popularity when the multitudes thronged to see him and to listen to his words, but in the hour of his trial they turned and fled. And now you think of these same men, think of the, the weight of guilt that they must have felt. Think of the shame that they must have felt. I think of Peter particularly when he denied the Lord. And the Lord had said, Peter, listen, before the rooster crows three times, you will deny me. And when he denied the Lord for the third time and the rooster crowed, it says the Lord turned and he looked at Peter. You know, there's a depth in that that I can't fathom. As the eyes of the Savior and the eyes of Peter must have locked across the crowd that was then assembled in Pilate's judgment hall. What was going through the minds of both? Can you imagine that sense, that overwhelming sense of shame that Peter must have felt on that occasion? Because when the rooster crowed, we are told that Peter remembered the words of the Lord. How the Lord had warned him that this was going to happen and he protested vehemently, yes, and earnestly that it could not happen to him. Now it had happened to him. And it overwhelmed 
was she in the scriptures record that he went out and he wept bitterly. You think of the inward nagging voice that a fall or a failure brings to a believer. It seems that incessant voice coming from within simply repeating over and over and over again, I am a failure. I am a failure. Satan, of course, makes use of this, doesn't he? He says his amen to that, doesn't he? He gets us even in the midst of that to question the reality or even the sincerity of our faith. The, word, uh, the words, I have failed, I have fallen, seem to collapse our world in upon ourselves. And yet, and yet, it is to these same men that the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, manifests himself. And you know, when that word I have failed keeps nagging on our hearts, it often leads to another thought and to another word that nags on our hearts. Not only I have failed, but I am finished. The Lord will have nothing to do with me now. The Lord will have nothing but disgust for me now. His affection for me, if it still exists at all, must be greatly diminished. Would he ever want to see me again? Would he ever want to fellowship with me again? Could he ever use me again? I think there must have been something of this feeling that he was finished in Peter's mind, and I, I deduce that, at least I think it's certainly a possibility, because why would he have said, I'm going a-fishing? Remember that it was fishing from which the Savior had called him three years earlier. He was a fisherman, and he left his boats and nets behind him to follow after Jesus Christ and to be engaged in the ministry with the Savior of proclaiming the kingdom. And, and now he's gone back to his fishing as if to say, my my service for Christ must be over. I may be speaking to a believer this morning. I, I don't obviously know everybody's life. In one sense, I'm glad I don't, because that removes the possibility of anybody ever thinking I'm, I'm preaching at them from the pulpit. I don't know that. But you know the Lord knows. And it may be possible that there is someone here this morning in this service, a child of God in truth, and you have fallen, just like these disciples. You have failed, like these disciples. There's no question in your mind. Your own conscience bears witness to the truth. And because of your fall, you now think, the Lord's finished with me. He could never, ever use me again. But pause that thought for a moment. It is to these people who were failures and who may have thought they were finished that the risen Lord manifests himself. There's another word. We've used the word failure. We've used the word finished. I think there's another word, frustrated. The, the, the word tells us here that these men, and remember who they were, uh, at least the uh, three of them whose names are mentioned here, or who are referred to here, were, were fishermen. And I would imagine that the unnamed two may have included Andrew. And so if that's true, Simon Peter and his brother Andrew, James and his brother John, these, these men have been fishermen. Back in the day, you never got a choice as to your occupation. You followed what your father did. And so from the earliest days, these men have been acquainted with the boats and the nets and the art of fishing in the Lake of Galilee. And out they go. And if anybody was going to get a catch, it surely must have been these guys. They knew all about it. And yet in spite of all of their efforts, in spite of all of their expertise, in spite of all of their experience, think of the three words. That night, they caught nothing. They were frustrated. They had failed again. 
Not only that they had failed the Lord, but they had failed in life itself. And they had failed in those things in which you would have thought that they would not have failed because they were perfectly qualified. As I've said, this was their calling. This was their occupation. This was their trade from the earliest of this. And you can only begin to think how that would have compounded the sense of failure that they already had. I think it's fair to say, as we look at these seven men on the Lake of Galilee that night, that uh, there are a number of words that would have described them. They were downcast. I'm absolutely sure of that. You talk to a fisherman who spent a lot of effort and time trying to fish, and he comes home with a stickleback. He's not, he's not a happy camper, is he? Think of these men who have toiled. Probably all night they have toiled. It wasn't that they lacked effort. It wasn't that they lacked knowledge. They come up with nothing. They feel depressed and downcast and despondent. Friends, this is where we often find ourselves as the Lord's people. Let's be, let's be clear. Let's be honest about it. But it was then. It was then that Jesus manifested himself to them. If I could put it that way, uh, this way, it was a time when they needed him most. And perhaps it was a time when they expected him least. There is nothing that indicates at all that these men were actually seeking the Lord or expected the Lord. The Lord's manifestation to them on this occasion came, as we would say, out of the blue. Unanticipated and unexpected. But as far as the seven disciples were concerned, feeling the weight of their failure, feeling that they were finished, frustrated in their own life and in their own experience, at a time when they needed Jesus most, it's then he appeared. Praise his name. And that leads me to talk secondly about the particulars of this manifestation. I think we can say this very simply and very obviously that he sought them. He sought them. In other words, the encounter that they had with Jesus on this occasion originated with him. As I said, there is nothing to indicate that they were looking for him at all. They have gone back fishing. Evidently, in spite of all their failure and all their faults, the Lord desired their company. They were on his mind and they were in his heart. Dear believer this morning, let me tell you this. That you may have come to this service this morning with a deep sense of shame and guilt of having failed the Lord and wondering in your heart of hearts, is he ever going to be interested in me again? Never mind, use me again. I want to tell you this morning, you're on his mind and you're still in his heart. You know, isn't that what the gospel is all about from beginning to end? It's not about sinners seeking him. It's about him seeking sinners. As far back as Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve sinned and failed and fell. <clears throat> what do we see of God here? We see God seeking them out, don't we? And that goes on right through the scriptures. And Jesus, of course, the great fulfillment of it all, he said, he said expressly himself that he had come to seek. He came to seek and he came to save that which is lost. You know, the gospel, friends, this morning is the gospel about a seeking God. You want to think about the story of Luke 15 again? The story of the lost sheep? The beautiful story that, 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 that tells us how that he left his 90 and 9 in the wilderness and he goes after the one that is lost and he seeks it until he finds it. And you may feel, Christian, this morning that you are that lost sheep. But you can praise the Lord this morning that if indeed you are, if you have wandered, the Lord is seeking for you because he's never forgotten about you and he's never ceased to love you. 
And his heart is set upon you and your rescue just as much as ever it was. Oh, my friend, this morning, listen. There is grace for fallen saints. There is a gospel for fallen saints. The Lord seeks. You remember how in Ezekiel, how the Lord upbraided the shepherds of Israel, the spiritual pastors of Israel, and one of the things that he uh, condemned them for was, he says, you have not sought out that which has wandered away. And so the Lord says, what you have failed to do, I will do. I will search out that which has wandered away. I will seek out my lost sheep. And oh, brethren and sisters, listen, though we fail and fall and may do it foully, the Lord will not abandon us. He will come after us. He will seek us. Until, like the lost sheep in the wilderness, he finds us and he brings us home. Praise his name. He sought them. He spoke to them. He said, children, do you have any fish? Just focus on the first word. How does he address them? Children. Children. The experts in Greek, and I'm not one of them, tell us that this is a, a word that literally means little children. And it is often used as a term of endearment. That's how he addresses these seven disciples. Oh, you know, he, he knew that they had deserted him. In fact, he had forecast that. He knew Peter had denied him. He had predicted that. And still he calls them and even though my friend this morning you may be identifying yourself with these failures and these disciples who have done so much grievous wrong against their Lord listen he still speaks to them with terms of affection and endearment and it's not only a term of endearment isn't it a term that reminds us of a relationship you're my children he's saying you're still in my family you have not ceased to be in that family, even in spite of your failure, however grievous and public that it was. Isn't that a lovely thought? That's how the Lord would address you this morning. If there's a Christian here who's feeling the weight of guilt and shame, the Lord would address you and say, my son, my daughter. And in so doing, remind you you're still his. And in so doing, remind you that I love you still. And then the Lord not only sought them, and the Lord not only spoke to them, but we know we see the Lord supplied them. He, they come to the shore, and lo and behold, what's on the shore? There's a fire, there's a charcoal fire there, and there's fish already laid upon it, and there's bread there. Where did the Lord get all of that? We're not told. This was a miraculous provision. But the point is this, that for these men, now imagine them just for a moment, they've been out fishing all night on the lake, expending a lot of energy, fishing and back in the day, and I know nothing about fishing, but I know this, that back in those days it was, a, it, was a, it was a lot of physical effort, what they call in Ireland donkey work. And then they expending that strength all night. They were exhausted, they were hungry, and they get to the shore. And what do you know? The Lord has a supply of provision already waiting for them. Isn't this lovely? What they failed to find by their own efforts, Jesus Christ supplied to them freely by his grace. And isn't that always the way with our Lord? That he gives us what we need just exactly when we need it. And he gives to us that in grace we haven't earned it and we sure don't deserve it. And yet there it is. All provided. All ready. All waiting already for us. I want to go even further and just say this. That the Lord, what is it, what is it that the Lord provides for our hungry souls? He provides himself. Because he said, I am the bread of life. It is upon him that, that we feed by faith. He is 
And he told us this himself in John's Gospel chapter 6, that he is the fulfillment of the manna that came down from heaven. He says, I am the one that has come down from heaven as the bread of life, and I give life unto the world. And he says, if you feed on me, you will never hunger. If you drink of me, you will never thirst. What is it that we need as fallen, failing Christians, frustrated so much with our own failures? What we need is found in Christ himself. What we need is Jesus Christ himself. And thank God it's exactly what he gives us because he gives us not benefits merely. He gives us himself and all the benefits that are in him. And not only did he supply what they had failed to find, there was fish upon the fire, but he gave them more beside. There was fish and there was bread as well. It's not always the thing with the Lord that he gives more than we expect. That he goes beyond our expectations. I love those words of the apostle now unto him who is able to do exceeding and abundantly above all that you ask for thing. And he's doing this for men who have let him down. That's the heart of Christ. That's the Savior that we have. And we wonder he comes after us and seeks us. He speaks words of affection to our souls, reassuring us of his love for us continuing and his relationship with us abiding. And he supplies what we need in all of its fullness and abundance. And I can't leave this thought as we look at the particulars of the manifestation without noting the fact that not only did he seek them, not only did he speak to them, not only did he supply them, but he served them. He served them. Look down at verse 13 of the chapter. And it says, Jesus came and he took of the bread and the fish and he gave it to them. Here's the Lord fulfilling the great role of the servant. What did he say in Matthew's Gospel or Mark's Gospel 10, 45? The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Paul re-echoes this truth in that great song of Philippians chapter 2. It says that he took upon him the form of a servant. And we can well understand that he is the servant of the Lord. We know that. We know that from Isaiah's predictions. The servant of Jehovah. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one, and whom my soul delights. And, and in all that Jesus did, he was serving the Father. He was serving God. But we, we balk at this truth that he serves us. And he does serve us. The same one who came to so serve us that he might take our place in death and judgment and die on our behalf. This is the one who took upon him the servant's role in the upper room when he laid aside his outer garments and girded himself with the towel and stood down and washed the feet of his disciples. And you know what tells us that when the Lord comes again, it says the Son of Man will come forth and he will serve them. Serving the ones who had failed to serve him. Oh, dear brother, dear sister, this is, this is the Christ in whom we believe. And he calls us, even in our failure, even when we have fallen, he says, come and die. For I desire your company, I desire your fellowship, I want to sup with you. And last week we alluded in passing to the story in Revelation 3 of the church the Laodicea, the, the church which rightly came under the rebuke of Christ when they said, we are rich, we are increased with goods, we have need of nothing. And they didn't know that they were poor and wretched and blind and miserable and naked. And it is to that church that it kind of shut the Lord out of their thinking that he comes and he says, behold, I am standing at the door knocking. And if any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him, I will sup with him, and he with me. Dear brother and sister, in spite of the way we have treated the Lord, and in spite of the guilt and shame that we feel on that account, the Lord still wants our fellowship. He still wants to be near us. He still wants us to enjoy His company and to enjoy His provision. That's for you, believer, and me this morning. And it's always true. Come and die, the Lord would say. 
Come and speak with me and eat with me and be with me. The last thought this morning is the purpose of this all. Very quickly. Why did the Lord do this on this occasion? Well, first of all, we can say that this manifestation of the Lord was evidence of his resurrection. Um, if there is one thing that is more attacked today than any other by the skeptics and the infidels and the atheists of our time, it is the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, and yet the evidence is overwhelming. This was no phantom that the Lord called this, that the Lord called his people to fellowship with and eat with there on the shores of Galilee. This is no hallucination. The Bible talks in Acts chapter three, or Acts chapter one, verse three, that he showed himself alive by many infallible proofs. They weren't hallucinating. He was not a phantom, he was real. When he showed himself in the upper room, you remember, he said, look, see my hands and my feet. Remember the following week how he said to, 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 to Thomas, put your finger into the scars and the nails in my hand and the, the spear wound in my side. Don't be faithful, faithless, but believing and hear. If we're not convinced by the fact that people were invited, he invited them to actually touch him and see that he was real. But here he actually invites them to eat with him. This was a further evidence of his resurrection and the reality of it and the nature of it. He physically, literally, bodily rose from the dead. Hallelujah. We confess that as our faith in the Apostles' Creed this morning, did we not? And the third day he rose again from the dead. We serve a living Savior. He's real. And it's not only something of a, an evidence of his resurrection, but another purpose was to display to them the endurance of his affection. You see, what we, what we do when we offend people is we, we feel, and perhaps we're right in feeling that because we've offended somebody else, their love for us has diminished, if not been entirely extinguished. And as we treat others and look upon others, we sometimes do with the Lord himself. And we think that because we have offended him, and we know we have offended him, because Romans chapter 7 tells us that there's a law in our members that's warning against the law of our mind and bringing us into the captivity of the law of sin, which is in our members. We fall, we fail, we sin on a regular basis. And we got this opinion that the Lord is chronically disappointed, if not disgusted in us. And that his affection for us, if it does exist, must indeed be severely re restricted because of our failure. And the Lord is saying this, and you forget something, beloved, that my love to you is not dependent upon your efforts. It's not dependent upon your successes. My love for you is a gracious love. We never deserved it to start. Never deserved it to start. When we were still sinners, Christ died for us, Paul says in Romans chapter 5. And having loved us when we were still rebels and guilty of cosmic treason against our God, if he loved us then, we can be absolutely sure that in spite of all, he loves us still. And he's the same yesterday, today and forever. And you will remember how that when Israel sinned as they did in the times of the prophets, we refer to them in the Old Testament as the major prophets especially, and in the times of Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and others, and as the Lord calls his people to himself and calls them away from their backsliding, he calls them with this assurance that he has redeemed them, that he has loved them, that they are his, that they belong to him. And his manifestation to these failed disciples was to state again and to display again the endurance of his affection. The Lord loves you, brother and sister, this morning. Failure though you may be, fall though you may have, he still loves you. And finally, 
The purpose of this resurrection, of this manifestation, was not only evidence, of further evidence of the reality and nature of his resurrection. It was not only the display of the endurance of his affection, but it was in order that there might be the experience of his restoration. Now that takes us beyond verse 14 specifically into, into Peter's restoration. But think of this this morning. I know there is a there is a belief among some Bible believing preachers that if a preacher falls, he is never again fit for the office of preacher. Well, what are you going to do with Peter? Peter fell, did he not? Did the Lord was the Lord finished with him? You, you read the next the next verses as the Lord challenges Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And then he says, feed my lambs. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. And on the day of Pentecost, this saint of the Lord who had fallen so badly preached a sermon in which 3,000 souls were converted. You see, the Lord is in the business, brethren and sisters, not of casting us off, but of restoring us. <coughs> That's the truth. That's the teaching of this manifestation. That the Lord was there. Yes, other disciples, they needed to be restored as well. But Peter among them all, he seemed to be that he was the one that was to be focused upon because he had gone beyond desertion to denial. He was guilty, as it were, of the greater sin. And yet it was to this man that the Lord extends the grace of restoration and forgiveness. May these truths today encourage our hearts. Because you know there is a very real sense. There is a very real sense in which we can say this. We are all failures this morning. All of us before. Well we've just got past doing. We've sinned already today. What does the Lord think of us? What is his heart still towards us? It's the same as it ever was. And he wants us to fellowship with him and be near to him and enjoy him and experience him. And so he says to us all today, come and die. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness, your grace, Thank you for the Saviour that we have who loves us with an eternal and an everlasting and enduring and unchanging love. And thank you, Lord, that when we fall, you do not cast us off. You do not turn away from us, but you turn again to us and you seek us and you find us. And when we are lying down in the mud because we have fallen and sin, Lord, you come and you lift us up and you clean us off. And you walk with us again and you use us again for your kingdom and for your glory. Hallelujah, what a Savior we have. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.